Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I'm joined by just one of my co hosts, uh, Ricardo Martinez. It's uh, Jerry's birthday today as we film. Um, and today we are interviewing the great Felix Creason, uh, a developer, entrepreneur, investor, and uh, he is notably uh, co founder and CTO of the largest electronic payments processor in Romania, uh, Netopia. Um, and also was co-founder of Romania's first cryptocurrency exchange, BT BTKO.io. Um, but yeah, uh, Felix, first off, um, how are you doing? Uh, and is there anything else you want to let people know in, uh, in a quick introduction to yourself? Yes. Hello. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon. Good uh, morning, wherever you listen to that, uh, that, this podcast. Uh, indeed. So I'm... Um, I'm uh, involved in this uh, crypto as well in the traditional payment uh, area, and I'm, I've been dealing with crypto related stuff for probably around 10 years uh, by now. And since about 2015, we also do crypto in a business uh, environment, meaning that we provide services that are based on crypto. Nice. Thank you very much. Well, I, uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll dig straight into my, um, my first proper question, because um, Sarah is interested to talk to someone who, you know, you've done, it looks like you've done, well, two very big things as it is, right? Like an exchange and a payment processor is pretty, pretty huge. Um, but yeah, I guess um, as someone who's obviously like working currently in electronic payments in Romania, uh, you have quite a unique position or a view because you've got, got access to a lot more information than most ordinary people would. Um, so I guess... Uh, how uh, how how have you seen uh, the payment landscape itself, just the online mm -hmm. payment landscape, adapt over the last sort of decade in Romania? Like, is crypto becoming more of a part of the payment world, or just sort of stable? Like, I guess, like, how how have you seen that adapt over time? Um, let me first start from the traditional uh, traditional area, whereby we we've seen even outside of talking of, of any crypto we've seen a, a very big dematerialization of money so virtually every transaction or I, I should say most transactions at least those done in the urban uh, areas are uh, electronic transactions anyway and i will come back to to this because it, uh, this is a, an important aspect but uh, now I will go to the to the crypto part, and I will make uh, make make a reference to a couple of uh, reports done, I think, by by ING, uh, which uh, analyzed uh, or, or I probably should say interviewed a bunch of people in various countries around uh, Europe, and their conclusion was that uh, Romania is, uh, I think, that the second. Uh, country in Europe in terms of crypto awareness. And now being on the ground here, I'm very well aware that a lot of the people would say that they are aware of crypto and they maybe even have crypto uh, just because, I don't know, they use uh, uh, one of these uh, neo banks and they offer some crypto like contract for difference or other derivatives and they, they would consider that as, as interacting with crypto. But uh, uh, nevertheless, I think that uh, uh, the, the public perception is here, although it's not always a positive perception, but uh, you know, at least uh, in, in terms of people knowing that uh, this thing is here and uh, maybe would have a, a significant impact in the future then it's it's a good uh, it's a good thing yeah and i guess like um because you say like obviously yeah there's a there's a good perception not always positive obviously um but i i, I figure i mean i'm making a big assumption here but I, I would have assumed that in romania um and surrounding countries that like the 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 view on crypto is probably slightly more positive than it is actually in like the UK and the US, as a, just a guess from my experience in other countries, like when I visited Brazil and other European countries. It, it is, and uh, this is uh, mainly due to the fact that there were no, I mean, in the, in the bigger countries or in the more developed countries, the 
negative view tends to come from from the top meaning that there are there are some people that are in government or in government related uh, institutions like uh, let's take an SEC or uh, some FINRA or whatever, that would say uh, something which would be construed as being uh, negative towards crypto. In here, the, at least uh, uh, with some very notable exceptions, uh, the, the talk about crypto tends to be neutral, meaning that, for instance, the National Bank tells people we don't have anything against it. Just note that uh, it's not an investment uh, uh, instrument and you are very likely to lose money if you put money because let's face it, um, uh, at least up until I would say now, uh, a lot of the uh, retail um, driven um, involvement has been uh, driven by uh, potential gains, meaning that I buy now cheap and I sell later more expensive, therefore I make a profit. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think that because of the, the fact that uh, at the top level, people tend to be more neutral, then, then the, general, uh, uh, the general view is uh, somehow positive or leans towards being positive. And uh, of course that there are, there will be people and it's no it's no surprise that first of all there are people that there, there is a specific category of people meaning that if you take the intersection of uh, by age and then by sector in which they work, the older they are and the more they work closer to the financial sector, they tend to have a, a more a negative view. So if for them, for them, it's uh, somehow, uh, although they, in theory, they know very well how the, the fiat money works, they tend to think that uh, uh, it, because nothing backs any of the crypto uh, that, are, that are widely used, uh, they, they cannot be valued as much as they are because uh, I don't know why what's the, the reasoning behind, but because nothing backs it, uh, it's not real and it's a, a Ponzi scheme and uh, everybody will uh, cry in just a few months and uh, whatnot. Does the majority of the trading taking place in Romania happen on exchanges like your exchange or does it happen in like peer-to-peer -peer exchanges like local Bitcoins or Telegram groups? I... I'm pretty sure that most of it takes place is on, on regulated exchanges. Uh, and uh, I want to underline that what we operate is not like a full exchange. We, we merely provide a sort of a brokerage uh, solution for our merchants because we come from the, from the payment processing side. So we allow our merchants to uh, accept uh, cryptocurrencies in exchange for their goods and services. And uh, if we take this uh, type of service uh, uh, out and then we take that th there would be some peer-to-peer -peer transaction happening, but I would say that 95% happens on, on uh, exchanges, regulated or less regulated uh, exchanges, yes. And, and mm -hmm. I, 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 can continue, I can continue on that, or maybe if you have other questions, I, I can stop now. But I, I would say that due to the fact that a lot of people uh, interact with crypto through exchanges, that creates, even for people that, that are into crypto, it creates a very different view of what crypto means. And I'm, I'm here referring to this custody of assets. And this is something which I cannot uh, outline. And every time I have the chance to talk about it, I, 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 I try to, to make people understand that uh, letting somebody else manage your whatever crypto assets you have manage it, managing by, managed by somebody else, it's not, uh, it's not a good idea. If you really want to, you need liquidity and you want to do a trade, then... Uh, send from your wallet, do the trade, um, withdraw to your wallet. Not, uh, don't leave uh, funds uh, sitting too much on, on this exchange. That's awesome. That's literally, I was going to ask you that question like right, right yes. after, because obviously yes. you mentioned about um, 
because you mentioned about people having exposure to cryptocurrencies via yeah. like these uh, tech banks and things, things like Revolut, for example. Yes, UK exactly. Being purchased. Exactly. Um, and I, I was going to ask whether you know what your opinion was on that. I suppose. It, 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 from your experience, I guess, and understanding, and I suppose, I don't know if you guys keep track of like the wallets that make crypto payments through your processing um, company, um, but like, are you, are you finding that the majority of people are using custodial services or if it's, uh, is that yes. what you're finding? Yeah? Okay. Yes, yes. And, and, and uh, I, would, I would now go to the two biggest problems that we have in, in providing this type of service for, for our merchants. The first, of, of, okay, now I will, I will go a bit maybe technical, but not really technical. And I would say that um, because of the nature of, of all the cryptocurrencies, uh, uh, we are very bound to a specific uh, uh, period of time in which we need a transaction to be performed. And that's why we generate, uh, we, when we generate uh, Bitcoin addresses, we um, uh, allow uh, 10 minutes for the payments to be done. This doesn't mean that the payment needs to be confirmed in 10 minutes. We just want to see that the, the payment is uh, is received in, in this window of 10 minutes. And because of people that are using custodial services and usually withdraw money from the exchange, uh, they cannot, uh, they cannot uh, fit in that 10 minute window and this of course causes us a lot of uh, a lot of uh, customer support interactions and so on my guesstimation is that uh, about 50% uh, so half of the people that interact uh, with our uh, crypto payment service uh, actually use custodial wallets and uh, because of that uh, they are not able to fit in that 10 minute window and the second uh, th uh, thing that happens and this is uh, also tend, tend to happen more on the custodial uh, wallets, but it's also um, a feature uh, of uh, people that have their own wallets is that people don't really understand how, what the deal is with these fees that, you, that, that usually the sender pays or the, the people, that, that the person that withdraws something from the exchange. The exchange, if you withdraw, I don't know how many 0 0.005 Bitcoin, it will take uh, another uh, uh, fee and the amount that you, you actually receive to the receiving uh, withdrawal address, it will be smaller than what you requested. So uh, the, this, this is the second biggest uh, problem or, or customer support uh, uh, reason uh, for for uh, contacts from our payment for for the users that pay to our merchants. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah. So custody, I suppose, beyond it being your personal view, that obviously not your keys, not your crypto kind of thing. Yes. Okay, that's that's my kind of personal view as well. Uh, but beyond that, obviously, the custodial solutions are actually causing an issue, you know, with the actual real time payments. Yes. And that's yes. definitely something as well, because like sometimes if I if I have something left over in exchange and I want to use it to pay, I'm always like, oh. You know, I've got to wait for like X amount of time. I've got to pay my fees to get out. It's always just frustrating. Um, yes, yes. So I can completely uh, understand that for sure. That's yes. a huge issue with bit refill as well. Um, yeah. A lot of the support tickets we get are for the exact same reasons. Yes, I, I, I imagine that uh, that uh, every every business that has to deal with uh, with cryptocurrency, uh, and I uh, because of of people and I. I venture to guess that it's the, this uh, feature of uh, people tending to use um, custodial uh, solutions is not uh, unique to Romania. So I would expect that about 50% of your uh, of your customer uh, requests are, are because of these custodial uh, solutions that don't fit in a window, don't take into consideration fees and uh, I think that that's pretty much it. If this, these two features are, or these two problems are solved, uh, then everything would work in a much or more or less automatic way. You said your company offers a variety of crypto-based services for merchants. Uh, do you guys also offer a Lightning Network payment? process we we don't offer it uh and it's only a matter of uh, not having uh, demand not having demand for it i mean 
uh, crypto uh, lightning uh, services would require uh, locking some funds into a channel and so far based on the requests which we received which was i think maybe once we we received in the last three years a request for somebody wanted or asking if they can pay with lightning uh, based on the level of uh, of requests uh, of, of interest that we've seen uh, it doesn't seem to be so so popular and again it, it kind of makes sense if you if you consider the fact that 50% of the people tend to keep their wallets on exchanges on, or, or on other custodial wallets, uh, then it would make sense that they don't know about Lightning and how the Lightning uh, network work and uh, what's, what's good and what's bad about it. Yeah, I can understand that, I suppose, actually. Yeah, and I, and I guess, because um, I think this is the thing, I think cust custodial solutions... Whilst I'm personally not a massive fan, I mean, I've used them before, obviously, um, but I, I guess they're, they're very important, though, because there's a lot of people, a majority probably, I'd say, of, of people I've met um, are used to, okay, my money is in my bank. If I send, you know, if something goes wrong, someone steals it, something, you know, a transaction gets done badly, someone is going to cover me for this. It's fine, you know what I mean? And like, I don't have to worry about my X amount of money. And that's very reassuring for a lot of people. And for some people, that is yeah. the best way. Some people don't want to look after their own money. And then I kind of, you know, understand why sometimes. Um, so I guess, I suppose what, what uh, the, the solution, I suppose, the, the easy solution would be to, you know, remove like, lower fees or remove fees to, to take funds out of an exchange or from a custodial wallet and also to you know speed up the time uh, to withdraw fees right they're the simple solutions but i guess like what do you think the solutions are moving forward for like you know pulling people away from those custodial solutions and only using them when they have to and, uh... you know in the in the beginning i said that uh, a lot of the of a lot of the money involving transaction, either being money transfers or payments or and, and related services have been de dematerialized uh, in the last, especially in the last 10 years and, uh, and even before. And this prepared uh, the ground for, for uh, I mean, if, if you already have an electronic payment solution and you already pay with the phone, it doesn't really, uh, matter for you as uh, as the person that pays if the money that are being taken uh, uh, are being taken from your bank account or for from a uh, from a custodial wallet. So uh, maybe the, the the only way I I see uh, I see this working is if these custodial wallets are somehow integrated and Lightning Network is is a good uh, it's a good example of integration in which. You cannot really pay less because uh, the the transaction will never uh, propagate, or if in, even if it's propagating, uh, if it's not completed, it will revert after after uh, after some time. And uh, I, I believe that in, in some some services or some developments in this area, whereby uh, you can make things much more integrated and having more services like uh, LNURL and, uh, and you know, seamless in, 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 in the end, you, you need to have seamless uh, transactions. And, and it's true that when, when you take the, the burden of people having to guard their keys and remembering passwords and whatnot, and uh, compare it to the uh, maybe easiness of uh, dealing with cards and, you know, wherever you have a problem, you just flip your card and there is a number. Well, if you flip your ledger, there is no number. You cannot call anybody if, if somebody goes wrong. So people, just because people are uh, inherently uh, lazy and this is it's, uh, is the human nature. Why bother with something if I can obtain the same outcome, not, not having to do this uh, at all? Uh, because of the uh, human nature, people will always prefer uh, the, the banks and the custody and somebody else dealing with the keys. The only time when people start realizing that it's important to manage your own keys is if your bank froze your account because 
whatever and and these these days you you see a lot of a lot and a lot more regulation especially in the in the eu but also in other uh, countries like banning people do specific types of transactions and requiring people uh, justify their uh, their uh, why did you send this money to this business and uh, you know this intrusion intrusion of of the state in 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 the end in in the private lives of of citizen uh, of citizens will have as a as a result people starting to realize but do i really need to provide these details to the government what solutions are there to to not be able, to not be required to do this and people will say yeah but this means that people will uh, will uh, um uh, hide money and will not pay taxes and I, I i i would say that in this case maybe the the tax system needs to be re uh, rearranged and needs to be a new thinking about what's uh, what uh, taxes should mean or, or would mean and how people should interact with the state from the tax point of view and i'm sure that if people would see benefits coming out of their uh transparency about money people would be willing to to not hide their money if if that is even the case which i i strongly believe that it's not i mean everybody i know uh, that that does uh, crypto transactions are much more uh, rigorous about reporting and paying taxes versus a lot of uh, uh, other persons that you you read in, in the newspapers and you see on the news that they use all kinds of uh, offshore accounts and consulting services in order to, to bypass these uh, taxes. So, yeah. Does the majority of, of people in Romania, are, do they have bank accounts or are they primarily unbanked? Uh, they, they have. I mean, it's probably the, the um, uh, uh, unbanked population is less than 20% or, or some, somewhere around uh, this, this figure. There are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of bank accounts, there are a lot of cards. Now, the, the other question is, or, or maybe when we or, or the national bank or whoever reports this number, maybe they should uh, take out uh, of the reporting uh, two transactions per month. Yeah, one funding and one withdrawal. Because if we take this uh, out, we will find out that uh, uh, maybe it's only half of the people that, that have, uh, that could be considered banked because the other ones uh, do a single transactions per month or maybe two because one it's funding like they receive their salary and the second one is withdrawal of their of their whole amount and may, maybe again this is if you think about my my previous point that i made about government uh, uh, snooping around your bank account and maybe even being able to freeze maybe there are people that say why should i left uh, the government or the bank uh, report to the government what I do with my bank account, I will take it in cash because cash is for, for better or worse untraceable. So maybe maybe this is the reasoning behind of at least a part of those uh, of those transactions. But anyway, I, I would venture to guess that out of those uh, that actually have a bank account, uh, a pretty significant uh, significant chunk of them will only have two transactions per month uh, registered to that uh, to that account. Something that you said earlier as well, which is interesting, is like, um, I guess, the concern about uh, people not reporting transactions, not reporting and, yeah. uh, their taxes. And let's be honest, you know, people aren't doing it now, are they? <laughs> like, as you said, you know, it's, no. like, it's like one of the easiest uh, ways to hide your, your income or your money or your assets is to just have a, to get a UK company, actually. And people always think about this crazy island Actually, no, a company in the UK is often the best way. It's what like OneCoin did, for example, to hide all of their dodgy uh, financing. Yes, um, because yes. you can just get one like that on the internet. It takes no yeah, time. Yeah, it takes money. three minutes and it costs you virtually no money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you can basically hide who owns it, all sorts of things like that. It's kind of technically you should be able to, but you can't. But I, so I guess like people are already doing it. There's already ways to hide your money. There's already ways to not pay your taxes. There's already ways to get around it even legally. 
So I feel like with cryptocurrency, it's more that people are, it's more the government's just like, we don't want another way for people to do it. Like, we just don't, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's another way. Uh, can we, it doesn't really give any benefit to us right now. Well, then yeah. let's not bother with this. Um, so I suppose, um, I, I think that criticism people often have of crypto is, is yeah, no to that degree, I guess. Uh, it's just another way that someone can abuse something that people are already abusing other things anyway. Um, but I guess um, uh, the other thing, I suppose, as you were kind of hinting at, was that like, um, I suppose if you if you make custodial non custodial solutions almost dressed up like they are custodial, right? Like simple enough to use, like it's a bank app, or really similar to what people are used to, um, then potentially you've got the answer to that solution of like how do you get people to to, to do things. But I guess the other thing as well is like um, like I was watching a I think it was Bill Gates on, in 1995 on an American talk show. I can't remember which one it was, and the guys, you know, he's like. I've heard you can now listen to uh, the baseball game on the internet. It's like, why do I want to do that? And then he's like, well, you know, it's, it's cool. And then he's like, oh yeah, I've got the radio. I don't need that. And he's like, you can record it. Well, I've got tapes. You know, people just didn't get the internet like at all at that point. So I'm thinking we're there at crypto, right? Like surely in 10 years time, people will have a better education, a better understanding. Um, and these problems will be more sort of in the past, I would hope. I hope so, the, uh, and I hope that all the, the the whole movement around crypto, meaning the and especially the value movement part of the crypto, yes, because uh, just as internet uh, internet uh, meant uh, evolution in the information movement uh, um, uh, paradigm. Uh, crypto will mean an evolution in the value movement paradigm meaning that you will start to move uh, value in a different thing and uh, in a different way and with this uh, new thing uh, it's also uh, will also help humanity on one hand uh, bypass i hope some of the anachronisms that you find in in the current uh, uh, banking and financial system and on the other hand Maybe by by reducing the link between uh, money and the state, or uh, ideally severing it completely, maybe people will start to realize that uh, a lot of the things that the state and the government does are not uh, really necessary. And uh, uh, maybe in the absence of some things which are regulated by the state or are done by the state, uh, private solutions will will appear and at the end of the day everybody would be better off not having to deal i mean in, in a in a country you don't really have to uh worry as a as a, an individual citizen with what happens with the uh, people that didn't receive their uh, government salary in a, in a community which is uh, uh a hundred or a thousand kilometers away you you cannot do anything uh, about it so why not focus focus on on your local community on your uh, you know having a smaller uh, or or in closer geographically to the person uh, government and you know moving towards uh, uh, less distributed if you will uh, form of government instead of having countries, maybe focusing more on counties, maybe focusing more, more on like cantons and what what are uh, forms of uh, organization in, in in other countries which uh, work uh, pretty much uh, pretty good. And uh, I, I will go back to this uh, thing that I said about anachronism. So. I will give you a single example. I, I mean, today when you do you, when you do a card transaction, uh, this card transaction, you have a card that is issued by a bank, and you uh, put your your card either uh, physically or virtually in a in a terminal. Uh, um, term, uh, physically, if you are in a store and you tap your card or you put it in in, in a terminal, or virtually if you are on a payment. Uh, page or you use Apple Pay on, on, on the web and uh, you do a, an online transactions. And this transaction today, even today, which is like uh, uh, 60 years or 70 years since the first car transaction has been, 
has been done. Even today, the uh, car transaction is done in two steps. One is the authorization phase in which your, your bank, the, the bank that issued your cards confirms to the bank that tries to, uh, to, to, to process the payments that you have indeed the money. And then there is a settlement phase in which one day or depending on a lot of uh, parameters, the money, the, the, there are some files that are being sent from one bank to another uh, through Visa and MasterCard and Amex and uh, JCB and Discover and what other uh, networks are there. And then the money will actually exchange hands. And if you, if you look at it historically, back in the 1980s, it, it made sense because then uh, you would, th there were no electronic, there were no online payments. Everything was done with a piece of paper. You had this imprinter uh, that would uh, uh, take the details from your credit card. You would sign it and then there would be a, a, a settlement phase where these physical checks uh, ended up in your account and then the money exchanged hands. But this settlement phase in, 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 in the crypto settings doesn't make sense at, at all. And it's very easy to disappear and, and uh, what the effect of this phase disappearing mean, means that um, any merchant or, or any entity that, that processes a payment now can, can use the funds now. It doesn't have to wait for one day or three days or five days or two weeks, depending on, on the processing uh, card processing agreements that they have with the bank or whoever, whoever processes their payments, they, they can use the money now. And, and this is uh, like the crypto, uh, all the crypto transaction network uh, uh, value movement figured out a way in which, yes, uh, in, in, in 10 minutes or in, I know that Bitrefield does zero conf uh, transactions. So instantly you can benefit from your uh, goods and the merchant uh, benefits in the same instant from the money. So nobody has to have a second phase and uh, another infrastructure that handle, handles this settlement phase. You make a good point, yeah, about essentially the, the idea that these, you have these two phases kind of being, yeah, unnecessary and almost obsolete. I suppose something that you mentioned as well in there um, when you were talking about obviously, you know, changes to taxes and almost the changes to the way we see governments um, and borders to a degree. And this is something that I've, I find really interesting, actually, because um, with Bitcoin, right, with its design, the way it's impacted the world, to me, I can see two really almost complete opposite effects that it has. And one is that obviously it's a global currency, right? It's not tied to a country. So immediately it could just be a world currency. And obviously it kind of almost it, it contributes to the whole Internet side of things where the whole world is opening up and it feels like everyone's closer together because you can all contact each other and on the other flip side i can almost see that like bitcoin has this ability to like support local communities and local businesses and smaller businesses it's a way almost for people to fight back a little bit at the established bigger companies so i kind of see like bitcoin doing like nothing for the middle which is kind of like having a country border with a big government but much more for as you said like this smaller local community style of running things but also kind of like you're a small local community, but you're a big part of the whole world rather than just a country. Um, I didn't know, like, um, I didn't know if you saw that as just as a good, as an overall a good thing, but also, I guess if you you know if if you can think of any ways that like Bitcoin, because obviously its adoption is going this way. I didn't know if you can yeah. think of any ways that it was it could be sped up or it, you know it, or if if it can almost be harmful to a degree that this is happening. Uh, I think that in in the the way in which the Bitcoin's adoption will be sped up is exactly because of the of this decentralization that happens in the in the work markets. Yes, meaning that today there is in maybe half of the economy there is no uh, requirement for a people performing a job to be physically located where the job is needed. Yes, and and the this last year this last year and a half has has uh, underlined that this is indeed the case so as long as you have no need for a person that is doing a job in for a company in cincinnati to be located in cincinnati uh, then the next step is okay so how how does this person 
receives the money for the, 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 for the job that he's done for the company in Cincinnati. Well, with a network that is, uh, that is uh, distributed and hopefully the government cannot uh, uh, impact it, meaning that cannot block it or, or anything else, because I will go back in, in a bit to one aspect that this means. And uh, you would not be uh, uh, subject to this two-phase uh, authorization and settlement and everything will happen in, in an instant. And you can even think about uh, what crypto can do, uh, can enable people to be paid like uh, instantly and continuously, meaning that as long as I'm sitting at, at uh, my computer and I do something, I don't know, maybe I write code, maybe I check some things in an, in an Excel file, then every click that I give uh, it means another Satoshi that, that is uh, wired into my, into my account. And th this is uh, with, with all the Bitcoin uh, and, and uh, other uh, constructions on top of it, this is achievable today. And um, I, I, will, I will go back now to, to what I said about the work market, the, the work uh, landscape and how it has changed. And consider the fact that today, if you are like, uh, I don't know, even me, as, I, as I'm a Romanian citizen, if I go to US and want to work for this company, for this hypothetical company in Cincinnati, I would not be able to, to do. To, to go there because uh, there is, uh, I would need a work permit, I would need uh, whatever, a green card or, or some other work, uh, some other work uh, regulated uh, employment form. But uh, in, in this distributed, uh, distributed information, distributed uh, value, uh, in internet based uh, thing, I, I don't need all this uh, work uh, regulation. The, 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 I, I always say that the the these employment restrictions can't be uh, enforced through firewalls because we, that that would be the 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 last point where where they would have a, like uh, you cannot work if you're not there you you cannot you can only implement it at a firewall level otherwise you cannot stop for somebody in India to take a job in San Francisco as someone that started a crypto company in Romania, how difficult is it to um, get licenses or permits or, or <clears throat> all the regulatory burden that you need to deal with? It's, uh, pretty, it's pretty difficult, especially in the last, I, and I would refer strictly now to the EU and things happen by, by extension in Romania. It's difficult, especially in the last uh, three years, I think, or maybe two, when EU has introduced, on, on one hand, the EU introduced some legal requirements for all uh, custody, uh, custodial wallets and uh, cryptocurrencies exchanged. But what they, what they failed to do, and this was more the job of the local authorities, they failed to, to issue norms for how this, uh, the so-called ML5 directive is to be implemented. And now we, we find ourselves in a sort of a, a limbo or a zombie land where there is a regulation, but there are no norms for applying these regulations. So whenever you want to do something, for instance, okay, I have these regulations, which means that uh, I can open a bank account. Guess what? Uh, no, because uh, the, the regulation says that you need to do this, but uh, the bank would say, uh, but because there are the, these norm, the, the, the norms that don't exist, I don't know what I have to ask from you in order to prove me that you do your uh, job according to the regulation or this kind of, uh, uh, you know, things that uh, one thing ends here and the other one starts here. So what's in between, it's uh, everybody's interpretation based on whoever you talk to. To say, obviously, with you being uh, part of the the first exchange in Romania, like how? Because obviously, there's 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 the environment now where obviously there's this regulation in the EU. Um, 
and there's obviously you know, regulations growing everywhere, like in the US and the UK, they're quite prohibitive for, for new businesses, um, especially. Uh, and I mean, even older ones like Binance is suffering in the UK with, with regulatory issues right now. Uh, like when it came to back in 2013, I think would it be when it was when you started uh, the exchange there, like that it's is 2015. 2015, sorry. Um, it's got to be a very different environment, right, surely, because there's no yeah. regulations at that point. So, like, how did you go about... I'm interested to, like, see how you went about... Because, obviously, there's no regulations. Uh, I'm assuming that people are a little bit... Well, some people are much more willing to work with you and some people are much more reticent. Um, like, how did you go about getting that fiat gateway aspect? Because, obviously, as the first exchange, too, in that country, it's got to be quite difficult to... to uh, we We... I mean, because we were already uh, in the payment uh, business for uh, for six, seven years by then. Now we are well, like twelve years. Uh, because we were in the in the business, we knew that there are some uh, instances, and we we tried to you know apply the same kind of thinking. So if we do for this kind of payments. We treat them in this way from the from the regulatory point of view, and this regulatory point of view meant simply uh, regulations around KYC and AML. So if we treat them this way, this uh, like uh, cards and uh, uh, what other uh, types of payments we were doing, let's try to apply the same the same rules and the same, uh, uh, if you will, uh, template for this uh, for this. Uh, area as well so this that that's what we try to do so in a way and and this by the way i think it's a story that you will you will find talking to any uh business that is related to crypto in in the in the willing or, or in the preparation for for the regulation that will come at some point or will uh, or, or some interpretation that must uh, will be done at some point by some government agency or by some law enforcement. They all all the crypto businesses are more proactive and they try to do more than they they would be required if they strictly follow the law. I, I think that this is the case in 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 all uh, in all. Uh, uh, instances that I've been interacting with other crypto-related businesses. It means that there are there is a sort of an over-reaction uh, and uh, you know willingness to do more than you are legally required to do, just because you know you you need to cover a lot more bases if you are in the crypto area than otherwise. The, I was reading today, because obviously we've had the whole situation with China going on for years. And, and obviously recently they, they then did push the miners pretty much completely out of most of the regions where they were doing their work. And they've obviously moved to you know, nearby countries and some to the US and, and all sorts of places. Um, they clearly seem to me anyway, to be trying to really move, remove and get rid of Bitcoin um, from the country in as, as best as they can and i guess there's probably many reasons for that uh, their own cbdc um the digital yep. yen, um i guess there's some element of protecting investors potentially um but there's probably various other reasons um but i guess um i suppose is there what's your view on this like do, do, do you see it in that similar way that china's obviously trying to to get pretty much trying to get rid of Bitcoin. And then how do you see that? Do you see that as like a benefit? Because I, I feel like I see that as a benefit almost to Bitcoin, yeah. but I don't know how you see that. And I, yeah. I want to kind of get you. I, I think that, I think that uh, uh, miners, especially or primarily miners moving away from China is a net benefit for, uh, for Bitcoin. Because first of all, the impact of anything related to the mining uh, switch being switched off or being moved out uh, in, in some other place or being uh, uh, I don't know relocated. The the worst case scenario is that for at most two weeks you will have uh, you will have a slower rate of block production. But once these two weeks are are passed and the the, the difficulty uh, is being adjusted, then everything is back to normal. And assuming that. Uh, uh, there are more countries that that want to do this. Uh, the only the only outcome will be that it will be 
more profitable to start again mining with your old uh, ant miner seven or whatever i i don't really know about uh, these uh, versions of, of mining equipments but you know some of the older equipments which were taken out because the because they were not profitable anymore they will be brought back online and will be starting uh, will be starting to produce money again uh, if a lot of the mining power uh, moves uh, moves out and if you followed and i i, I did not uh, follow everything that happened relating to the miner movement outside of china but i think that there is even uh, uh, so i said that it's a not net positive and it's because of two reasons first reason is the fact that one of the uh, regular uh, things that was coming against Bitcoin was, ah, uh, it's controlled by China. Look how many, how much uh, hashing power is in China. So by, by forcing the mining to move outside of China, this narrative has been uh, dwindled down. And the second, uh, the second thing is that uh, moving outside of China, at least from what I've, I've noticed, and even today there was a, a, an announcement, about a mining facility that started to use uh, nuclear energy. So what, what is the net uh, outcome is that the whole narrative around Bitcoin is very polluting and it's using uh, coal-based uh, uh, coal electricity and uh, uh, which uh, in, the, in, the, in, in its turn produces uh, uh, greenhouse effects and so on. Uh, has been again the, the environmental aspect of of Bitcoin mining has been uh, reduced. So it's already two points in which uh, through which uh, this movement of mining uh, outside China has been uh, benefiting Bitcoin. I guess I'm just thinking now as well. Like a, I guess a, a way because obviously you know beyond the mining, I, I suppose they haven't seemed to have done anything too much yet. But I, I'm going to assume with the CBDC with the digital yen rolling out more and more, they're probably going to try and push people out of holding Bitcoin, out of trading Bitcoin and buying and sell it. Um, and I guess the benefits with that become as well, like um, a lot of like Western countries that almost try to uh, compete with China and see them almost as an enemy, could then I guess people would see China and they'd see, okay, well, Bitcoin's essentially banned or discouraged there. Uh, and so almost it becomes a thing for like the West to go, well, it's not here, you know, like it's almost like, you know, it kind of becomes like a, a point in Bitcoin's favor, almost like, you know, it could it, yeah. be seen as well. This is the coin of freedom or whatever, you know, and, and therefore maybe adopted yeah. outside of China. Uh, I, I think that uh, in, in I would see a reason for China to start banning it. If you consider the whole social I don't even know how to call it social monitoring, let's say, program that they have. And the, the CBDC would fit very much into their social uh, enforcement, uh, social rule enforcement. Uh, if you remember, uh, they have this program where uh, they, they monitor your behavior like in the street, uh, they have cameras and if you cross the street in an unmarked place, then they will shame you, publicly shame you. And think about that with the CDB, CBDC, they will uh, uh, be able to automatically levy and fine, a fine on you. So from this, from this point of view, I, under, I would understand why China would want to, to uh, restrict it because uh, if you have your Bitcoin wallet, they cannot uh, help themselves whenever you, they need to fine you. But if you have your, only your uh, PBOC mandated uh, CBDC uh, wallet, then uh, it's, uh, it's much simpler. And um, uh, if I look on the other hand by, uh, you know, what would be the macro level uh, reason for China not to ban it, not to ban Bitcoin. Uh, I think it's uh, everything related or, or everything revolving around having a, a store of value that is not connected to any of the car big currencies that are uh, uh, in, in circulation in the world, meaning that uh, dollars and euros. Yes, yeah? so having a currency that is not adjustable at the whim of the US Fed. Because think about, think, think from, the, from the point of view, 
uh, of China as, as being uh, one of the big holders of, uh, let's say, U.S. Treasury bonds or, or maybe U.S. denominated uh, uh, bank accounts. Whenever there is a, some sort of movement like the U.S. inflation increases or the Fed decides to print some more dollars, their value that they store in their coffers uh, decreases. So with this, they, they can really uh, extricate themselves from the, from the uh, movements or, and the actions of uh, any foreign government. And, and on, on, the, on the other side, it's true that exactly what you said, that uh, uh, everything that that's would be or could be banned by China can be seen by, uh, by the Western governments as, look, because they are a very uh, careful nation and they want to monitor all their people, they did not want to... Uh, uh, use Bitcoin. So it means that Bitcoin is a better uh, privacy, uh, protect, privacy protecting technology than anything, any other form of money. So uh, let's use this uh, in our countries or in our part of the world. I guess it's interesting as well. Like I am, um, I was speaking on a space this is months back with Tracy, our China ambassador, and she was explaining as well that um, a big uh, motivation for the for the digital uh, yen and for China um, was essentially that they, because of the, um, I'm forgetting the word now, not an embargo, um, I'll say restrictions essentially that are placed upon them um, by Sanctions. the US. Sanctions, that's the one. Thank you very much. Sanctions. Because of the sanctions placed upon them, uh, she was explaining that essentially like, you know, the China, they couldn't pay, um, <laughs> it was crazy stuff. Like they can't pay uh, the wages of some of their, like the Hong Kong employees and like even the, the head of uh, Hong Kong and this sort of stuff, like because that goes through the dollar and then it, essentially because the sanctions, they're just completely struggling to do that. Uh, and obviously they want to take back, I mean, they, they like to control their populace anyway, the CCP, but they obviously yeah. want to take back control of their own money and their ability to pay their own people just in other countries and other regions. Uh, from, in, in this area, there is, a, uh, there is a somehow funny story, maybe three, four years back, where a Chinese billionaire bought... So in China, if you want to buy something in which requires a, a bank transfer of uh, capital outside of China, uh, it's very hard, maybe even impossible. So this billionaire, what, what uh, he did, he bought a painting for which he had to pay something like, I don't know, let's say a hundred million, uh, million dollars, but he paid with, a, with an Amex credit card or something uh, to that effect. So because because that transaction would not go to the to this regulated uh, to this regulated flow and uh, he could settle his bill in whatever in yuan and the then the bank would sell this uh, with would uh, settle this 100 million euros with the seller of the painting and uh, uh, this this kind of uh, things are happening just exactly because uh, in china the government tries to control very much uh, the, what people do with, do with their money. And of course, that the, the CBDC there, it's just uh, another step, uh, another stepping stone towards uh, a digital panopticon kind of uh, uh, environment. A couple of weeks back, we saw El Salvador make a Bitcoin legal tender for their country. And then tomorrow, they're presenting a bill in Paraguay to do something similar. Yeah. Uh, these are countries that are smaller with weaker economies. When do you see a larger Western country following suit? Um, for the larger countries, I don't have I don't have hopes that they will abandon their uh, their sovereign currency anytime soon. It will it will need to be a bottom up approach, meaning. The first thing that that would need to happen in a reasonably large country is to have all the uh, regulation that is needed towards making Bitcoin, for instance, uh, like accepted and not frowned upon. 
Yes. So as long as this happens, then uh, people will start realizing that if they keep their money in not in the fiat currency, but in something else, the their purchasing power will be preserved. Their uh, a lot of the things will be better. They they will have a better privacy and so on and so forth. And then they will start to say, uh, why do you keep issuing this this currency? which is, by the way, hopefully nobody will use it or, or gradually will stop being used because it's not attractive as a form of uh, um, um, money anymore. And then it will be maybe maybe natural, but this is a process in which, uh, which I think it will take multiple years, maybe 10, 20 years before we see a reasonable large enough uh, country, let's say a country from uh, G20. I, I think G20, it's, it's even further away than 20, 20 years. For, for smaller country is easier. And in, in, in El Salvador's case, it was even easier because they were already dependent on an external uh, currency, which they could not manipulate. It, manipulate. So being dependent on some other currency, more volatile or less volatile depends on from from which point of view you look. Uh, it meant not so much in technical terms. Of course, there are other considerations, but uh, uh, it's easier for them. For smaller countries, it's easier to to embark on on this trip than for the bigger ones. That's very true. Um, yeah, very true about the, the and yeah, it's benefits and. and pros and cons right like uh, you know big yeah. countries like the, like the us isn't going to willingly give up the dollar anytime soon no. i don't think um no it I, it, it needs to be a, a bottom-up uh, push meaning that uh, as long as people will start using alternative forms of money and by using them they realize that it's better you know they will have a gradually then suddenly uh, type of approach where whereby a lot of people you know a few people use it and more and more and more and then at some point there is this uh, 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 tipping point where people will will start uh, questioning themselves why do we still have this other ancient relic here uh, pretending to be money when we have this other form that is probably a better form of money that's true, and the bottom-up approach is going pretty well so far, I'd say. Uh, you yeah. know, only what, like ten, or eleven. Like, we're about a decade and a bit into Bitcoin, and it's, I'd say it's yes. pretty, going pretty well. Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, well, Ricardo, have you got any more questions you wanted to ask, or are you uh, are you okay? I'm okay. Yeah, as I say, I mean, I, I'm wary of time, so um, I'll, I'll we'll leave it at that. Um, I don't want to go down another a rabbit hole, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's been uh, well, it's been awesome uh, to talk to you about. Um, about the exchange, about the um, situation in Romania and yeah, general topics. I've really appreciated your insight. Um, and I'm sure our listeners will have too. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your day to, to talk to us uh, and to answer our questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. And uh, what can I say? Uh, yeah, let's uh, push for the adoption of crypto in every way we can in uh, in our local environments absolutely yeah i agree with that hands down yeah. um so yeah thank you and well thank you very much to everyone who's uh, listened as well much appreciated um but yeah everyone uh, take care and have a lovely day or week or weekend depending when you're listening um and buy bitcoin okay.